How's it going? Welcome back to another week of Core Home Groups. My name is Nick. I'm the pastor of Student Ministries here, and I am super excited to be continuing our series, The Big Picture, with you. Just a heads up, guys, like throughout the year, I'm going to be popping into your home group just to spend time with you. This week, I'm actually with the freshman girls, so that's awesome, and I'm really looking forward to being able to hang out with all the other groups as we keep going throughout the semester. So like I said, we are in this series called The Big Picture. And this is a three-week series designed for us to have a holistic understanding of the big picture of the Bible. And so last week, we started off by looking at the story from beginning to end. We looked at the, the four components that made up the story. You guys remember what they were? It was creation, fall, redemption, restoration, right? And we looked at this narrative and we said, okay, how does this fit throughout Scripture? And what does that mean? And throughout the big picture, looking from, at the story from beginning to end, we saw that a central figure in that story was Jesus Christ. That Jesus was the, the focus of that narrative, especially when it came to redemption and restoration. And what we need to understand is that if that is true, if he is the central piece of that story, we then need to look at his life, his teachings, and ascertain if this story fits within his life. Because if the central part of the story does not match with the story as a whole, then we shouldn't believe the story. And so today, we're going to be looking at Jesus talking the talk. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at a, a, a message of Jesus from the Gospel of Matthew that is probably one of his most famous, if not his most famous, messages that he ever gave. It's called the Sermon on the Mount. And it's actually in Matthew chapters 5 through 7. We're not going to try to read all those chapters today. But we're, we are going to start in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 1, and take a look at a passage that's often called the Beatitudes, where Jesus talks about being blessed. And what I want us to do is I want us to read through this and to say, okay, what, what are we learning from this? How does this fit into the context of that story that we talked about last week? And then to say, okay, like, what does it mean for me then? If we understand it to be true, and if Jesus' story, his, his messages match with the narrative that we talked about, what does that mean for me? So let's read this here in Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 1. It says, When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on a mountainside, and he sat down. And his disciples came to him, and he began to teach them. And Jesus said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. And blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. You see, Jesus starts this off and he, and he, he sees all these people coming to him. And he's like, hey, sit down. Let me, let me start teaching to you. And he starts rolling off with all these uh, sentences that begin with blessed. And we need to talk about that word. We need to talk about the word blessed. Because it comes up a lot in this passage, right? And this wasn't Jesus being ahead of his time when it comes to social media, okay? This wasn't Jesus inventing hashtag blessed right now. Um, but what he's doing is he's using this word for us to understand what he's talking about. And what I want to do is I want to kind of define that word blessed real quick. And here's what it is not. Blessed is not God saying that he will make everything right and good in that moment. And I think we see that in this passage, right? Um, because Jesus is, he talks about often here, if we go back to verse 4, in fact, he says, blessed are those who mourn for they will be comforted. Okay, Jesus doesn't say, okay, he doesn't go, hey, everything's going to be okay. He doesn't ignore the fact that people are mourning. In fact, he, he, he says quite the opposite. He's like, you will mourn. Blessed are those who mourn. He doesn't say everything's going to be perfect. Everything's going to be okay. It's not going to happen. Like life's going to be easy. He doesn't say that. But what he does do is he promises comfort. And so again, this is not Jesus saying that everything is going to be right and good in that moment. He's not promising easiness in this life. And we know that to be true because of what we talked about last week with the fall, right? There's sin in the world. Sin con convolutes this world and makes it hard and broken and separated from God. And it makes it difficult for us, okay? And so Jesus is not saying that everything is going to be right and good in that moment. That's not what blessed means. 
I believe what blessed means is this. It is God saying that he will bring about restoration and joy in his timing in your life. And again, if we go back to that verse, verse 4, right? Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Jesus doesn't, doesn't like shy away from the fact that like we're going to mourn. Life is hard. There are going to be moments that we are upset and we grieve and we try to process through and we don't know what to do. But he says, blessed are you who mourn, because you will be comforted. Jesus, again, he doesn't say when. Notice that. He doesn't say when, but he does say you will be. Because here's the thing. Often our timing and God's aren't the same. In fact, that's almost all the time. Because we want everything instantaneously. But God goes, no, I have a plan for you and I, you got to trust me on this. Like This is when it's going to be best for you. And so he says, blessed are you who mourn, and you will be comforted. And see, I think this goes back to that restoration and redemption piece. Because, you see, God does it in his timing. He says, I'm going to restore you. I'm going to redeem you. I'm going to bring about joy again in your life in my timing. So when he says blessed, it's God telling you he will bring about wholeness, restoration, redemption, joy, completeness in your life at just the right moment. That's what he's saying when he says blessed. But again, let's think bigger picture, okay? Let's get away from just a singular word and let's say, okay, how does this context of Jesus talking the talk, of him preaching the sermon, how does that fit into that narrative we talked about last week? Well, again, remember the four parts that we had, right? Creation, fall, redemption, restoration. And if we pick some of these verses out of here, and I think you can actually see all four of these components in multiple verses here, but if we just kind of pick four verses to look at, we'll see these four areas of that narrative in this passage. Creation, in verse 6, in the first part, he says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. If you go back to creation, they didn't have to hunger and thirst for it. It was right there. When God created humankind and he put them in the garden, we made Adam and Eve and he put them in the garden, they didn't have to worry about uh, physical hunger or physical thirst, nor did they have to worry about like hungering and thirsting for righteousness because it was all right there because they were in perfect harmony with God. And so here Jesus is painting a picture. He's like, blessed are you who now hunger for that because now you have to. But before in creation, you didn't have to. When it comes to the fall, Jesus talks in verse 3 about blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus is saying, look, the reality right now is that you will be poor in spirit at various points. When you are separated from God, like you realize your, your depravity and your need for him. You realize your desperate, desperate need for him. And that's a result of the fall, is realizing there is separation between perfect God and imperfect humanity. And he's saying, look, the reality is like you will be blessed for your inheritance is the kingdom of heaven. And he's already leading us into, in verse 3, that understanding of redemption and restoration. And again, verse 4, we've talked about this a few times, right? Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. That's redemption. Think about right there, that, that latter piece, they will be comforted, right? Jesus is telling us right there in that moment, the reality is like life is hard. As a result of sin, it is hard. But God is looking to do a redeeming work in our lives where he looks to make us whole, where he looks to remove that, that stigma of sin, that penalty of death. And so he's going to comfort us when we mourn. And then the fourth piece, right, the restorative piece. In verse 5, he says, Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. And there's phrases like that throughout this passage when he talks about people inheriting the kingdom of heaven as well. And it's crazy because we don't think about, when we hear meek, we don't think about them inheriting the earth, right? You don't usually look at somebody and go, Hey, you're meek, like you're going to be in charge of everything. That's how we look at it because our worldview is so jacked up. But like Jesus is saying here, check this out. The meek will inherit the earth. My people, the people who seek me out, they will inherit the earth and they will be restored to who they were when I first created them. That relationship will be righted and restored because of me. And so these four components are in God's story right here that Jesus is preaching. As he's preaching this, this sermon, we see these four parts of the story are, are radically represented in what he's saying. But then we need to say, okay, big deal though, right? What do we do with it? Like we have to ask that question. Like this is great that, that, that Jesus' talk is matching with this narrative, Nick. But like what does that mean for me? What are we supposed to do with it? Well, I think it's kind of like a twofold thing here. Because I think it comes down to whether you're following Jesus or you're not. Like if you're a follower of Jesus, I think we have an obligation. And we'll read about that here in a moment. 
But if you're not a follower of Jesus, if you're hearing this and you're going, man, I'm still trying to figure this out. I don't know what I believe. First of all, thanks for being here and being willing to listen. I appreciate that a lot. But second, we need to do some investigation then and say, okay, if this is true, right? Think of it about like as an if-then statement. If what Jesus says is true, then this is what the result should be. This is how I then should act. So what's the if-then statement? And I think Jesus answers that for us in these next few verses, picking up in verse 13. He's speaking to his disciples. He says, you are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. And in the same way, you let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Jesus already understands that, that as he's walking through the Beatitudes, those blessed passages that he just talked about, that people are going to go, great, what does that mean for me then, Jesus? What am I supposed to do with this? And again, I think if you're not a follower of Jesus, I think you need to investigate and say, okay, if this is true, then what does this look like? And if you are a follower of Jesus, I think we go, we know this to be true, then what do I do with it, right? And here's what I think we do with it. This is what it means for us. I think there's three things. First, it means that you need to trust Jesus in all moments. And whether you've been a follower of Jesus or you're trying to figure out if you are, this is probably one of the hardest things that you will have to learn. But if you read this passage, okay, if you read throughout this text, Jesus is saying, look, you are blessed even when life is hard. Even when life is good, you are blessed. And when life is in between, you are blessed. And I will see you through. But that's hard. I think if we are being honest, if we read this passage and we go, man, that is hard because some of those phrases, that's where I'm at. And he's telling me I'm blessed. Man, Nick, I don't know. I don't know. That's hard. But if you see whenever Jesus talks about, right, he says, blessed are those who, who mourn, they'll be comforted. You see what Jesus is saying? He doesn't give a time, but he promises that comfort. And that means that we need to trust that God has a plan that he's working in our lives no matter what. In the good, the bad, and the indifferent moments. That he has a plan for you. And he's looking to restore you, to redeem you. And so we have to trust that. And maybe that's a hurdle for you, whether you're following Jesus or you're not. But the reality is Jesus doesn't call us to a faith that is timid. He calls us to a faith that is powerful and active. And a faith that means that we have to trust him even when we don't want to. So you have to trust God during all moments. It also means that we need to understand that God's plan and provision isn't always going to be clear to us. But it's still working. And here's what I mean by that. You ever wonder if God hears you? You ever wonder why things happen the way they do? You ever wonder why it seems like God's not acting when you need him to act? <laughs> I mean, here's the reality. God doesn't function on our timetable. Again, we'll go back to verse 4, right? Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. There is no time frame, but there is a promise. You will be comforted. It may not be exactly when you want it. It may not be at the, the, the moment that you think you need it. But God is saying it will happen, and it will happen at the perfect moment for you. So we need to understand that God's plan and provision isn't always clear. We may not always see it or always know what's going on, but it's still working. And there's hope in that. that that's the encouraging part. Because sometimes when we don't see it because of how crazy life is, we know that there's still a plan. There's still something being worked out. And then the last one is this, is that if this is true, and you profess to be a follower of Jesus, what are you doing with it? You see, because verses 13 through 16 that we just talked through, we just talked about how Jesus is telling us to be salt and light in this world. Salt is great because it adds flavor. It makes the flavor just explode, but too much, and it destroys it too little, it does nothing. And when it's old and it loses its saltiness, don't even use it because it's not worth it, right? And a light, what does a light do? It brings, it brings brightness, clarity to the darkness. And Jesus is saying, look, if you understand this to be true, if you look at this big story, the narrative that we talked about from beginning to end, if my, my walking and my talking is matching, you have an obligation then to be an example of Jesus to this world. We get to be the physical representation of Jesus to this world. And so when people see us, when they hear us speak, when they watch what we do, how we engage with others, they should see Jesus in us. And my question to you is, do they? Do they see Jesus in your actions? Do they hear him in your speech? 
Do they witness Jesus in what you post, share, and like on social media? Do they see that, or do they see an agenda? Do they see Jesus, or do they see selfishness? Do they see Jesus, or do they see what else we worship? Guys, the reality is this, is that if we look at the big picture and if we understand what Jesus is calling us to, this is a challenge. It's not easy. It's hard. But again, if, if this matches with the narrative that Jesus gives us, that God gives to us, we need to ask ourselves, is it worth it? Are you willing to follow something that is going to make you whole and right again? We're going to keep talking through this. As next week we look at Jesus not only talking the talk, but also walking the walk and saying, okay, what then do I do with this if all of this is true? So I hope you guys have a great conversation in your home groups. I'm going to pray for you guys real quick, and then let's get into some discussion. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you that you are good, that you are holy, you are sovereign. We thank you that even in the midst of, of moments when we don't know if you're working or we question whether you are good, that you don't stop acting, you keep doing it. Father, help us to, to look at this with discerning eyes, to say, does this match up? Is this true? And if it is, then how, what do I do with it? How do I apply it to my life? And let us be ever mindful to be reflecting Jesus to this world. And we pray this in your name. Amen. Hey guys, can't wait to see you soon. Have a great week.